extraordinary book. It's a magic book I'm looking at um, and it's been produced by someone I've known for many years and it plays tricks on you, the reader. That's an extraordinary thing. First time it's ever been done. Mark Cecily Carter did it about 20 years ago, assisted by Anne Benkovitz, who I know well. I stayed with Mark many times at the New York Toy Fair in his apartment in Midtown um, Manhattan. So he produced this book ooh, all those years ago and it sold very well indeed. And it's so original because it's been so well designed that it plays tricks on you, the reader, who thinks you'll be able to understand just by looking at it. You don't at all. It's got a very, very clever cover to it, a very clever design. In fact, the cover, in fact, is the first one I'll show you of the two. Because this first one, all you've got to do is just turn this and you're looking at oranges gently turning on a wheel, about six or seven oranges. And as the last one disappears like that, underneath like that, it will appear the first of the set of oranges. Uh, oh, oh, there, there are the green lines now. How could that happen? Uh, wait a minute. Keep turning. Oh, here's the last of the green lines disappearing. So, what's going to happen now? Oh, they're back to being oranges again. But that distance, that distance is the same. What's going on there? Well, it's a very clever mechanical device inside, designed many years ago. I remember being with Mark when he was looking at it and admiring it, obviously thinking of things he could do with it. And this is a beautiful way of presenting it as a magic trick, which is baffling, until you read the explanation inside, of course. And there's one other one here which I am very fond of, because I do love missing area paradoxes, as they're called, where areas or figures seem to disappear. So he invites you to look at the um, magicians here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six of the magicians. And all you've got to do is take them out and insert them according to this colour scheme underneath. So as you take it out like that, you find there's a red there, but that's purple, so that's not right. But that's, oh, there we are, the purple goes there now. And this is a yellow one. Yeah, oh, there we are, the yellow goes into there like that. And the red's going to go into the red. Oh, well, of course it will, yes. But hang on a sec, Mark tells you in the text, now you've got to count it again. One, two, three, four, five. Where on earth is the last magician gone? Oh, he says in the blurb, look up my sleeve. Of course you must look up my sleeve, and there it is. <laughs> what a brilliant idea. And it's been so well produced, this. It's, it's a lovely job. It's very robust, too. I've shown it to hundreds of people over the last 20 years, and it's still standing up and still performing and giving people the fun of being fooled. So that's a brilliant one. Here's something a bit lighter, but it's still fun because I do love things which are not intended to be uh, 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 humorous. They're just signs put up, often in foreign countries, or people haven't quite thought out what they're saying and suddenly made an awful bloom. And they're notice boards, but they're out there for anyone to read. And if you do a second take of what has been shown, you'll suddenly say, hang on, hang on, hang on, you can't say that, or you can't do that, or what on earth does that mean? There's one here I'll show you an example of What's the English making fun of themselves, really, I suppose you have to call it? Because it's a sign in, in, in Britain where they point on a signpost beside the road and a tall post, secret nuclear bunker. Oh, my goodness me, what is the point of that? That's just absolutely zany. The British shooting ourselves in the foot or something. Extraordinary. So there's a lot of fun in there, and it's very natural humour because it's not intended to be humorous, it's just people perhaps um, putting things in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the wrong, in the wrong way, or their knowledge of English isn't enough to make them um, get the message across. But it's a lot of fun in that one. Something else I've looked at from time to time are fun patterns in the patent office. There's the laid out at the beginning of a patent, you have to lay it out like this, and then you fill in the great long forms, and you pay a few hundred pounds sometimes to take out a patent. And some of them are totally bizarre. Some of them, as you see one of them I've got here, is really quite sensible. But I'll just show you a couple of them which are my favourites, I think, in here, which I've tagged. The first one is an extraordinary idea. That's, it's showing a, <laughs> someone who invented something for taking your pet snake, would you believe, to the shops when you're shopping. So there's a python or an adder, not walking but slithering along the ground and you're holding it on the string. Extraordinary idea. To make a, a pattern on that is bizarre, isn't it? 
And this other one here I want to show you is very interesting for me because not that long ago, the last five or ten years, I came across a pair of socks with a pocket in the sock. And if you're wearing long trousers, it's a perfect way at the seaside or somewhere where you might get your, 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 your pockets being picked or you just drop things accidentally um, to keep them safe. You put it in the little pocket in your sock and it's under your trousers. No one will know it's there. So that one has actually been realised. It's, it's, it's suggested there's an idea and they've actually got it to market. And it, whether the others have been to market, I'm not too sure. <laughs> it's fun to look at. People's inventive minds, I think. There's another one here which is um, something I've come across many years ago. It's a funny sort of guttural way of saying something like um, Little Red Riding Hood story. But let me start with this first one here, which is, if you read it like this, you've got the words there, but that actually should read, Old Mother Hubbard went to a cupboard, but say it to yourself with the sounds of the words, it's just nothing like it. To bring her dog a bone, but when she was there, her cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog, he had none. When you say, the, when you say it out loud, and people um, hear it, they suddenly hear the words as the nursery rhyme. Extraordinary. And the other one which I've had in my mind for many years is Once Upon a Time. This is the story of Little Red Riding Hood. It's very short. It's only that page and that page, and there's the wolf being shown in Little Red Riding Hood. And it starts was once upon a time, once upon a time, etc. This is a guttural way of saying the nursery rhyme. Once upon a time, there was a little girl, a little girl, a little girl in a, in a wood with her, who wore a red riding hood. And it's a charming way of rendering well-known little poems and and, and, and things have been written down as essays, but uh, distorting them in an extraordinary way, making them sound as though you're, I don't know, East European or something, and they can't, well, they can't understand your accent. It's a gentle way of pushing fun, because many people have very different accents when they're talking English. Once upon a time, I love that. And the last one is a charming book, which is, I think is a very high-tech book, really, from Scott Kim, who I've known for many years, who does this upside down stuff and some of the stuff he's got in here is quite remarkable what he's done he was treading a completely new course when he first started doing this um there have been upside down pictures of all sorts but words as he's done is, is really quite extraordinary i'll show you four four examples of this book which i think to my mind are stunning of his ability to do this one here this one you don't even turn upside down you just reread it it's false and true false which is the red and the and the, and the, and the black and the red together f-a-l-s-e for false and it's got a placky at the end and then t-r-u-e appears in the bottom of the words of f-a-l-s t-r-u-e false and true what a lovely way of presenting it and an extraordinary way too and this one here is <laughs> upside down upside down u-p-s-i-d upside down and so we turn it upside down this is what you mostly do with his work and there's the same word again upside down oh my goodness all done with the words Wonderful. And the last two was a famous composer, Mozart. M-O-Z-A-R-T. Yes, turned that upside down. And there he is still M-O-Z-A-R-T. And just to compound it all, here's a little bit of his music on the last page, which is Mozart doing something like the same thing, something they call table music, where you look at the thing from two different ends, you have two, 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 two people actually playing the thing, and then blow me, it makes music. So this is Mozart being at his most ingenious and perhaps anticipating Scott Kim's work. Because when you read it that way, or you turn it upside down and read it that way, and you stand either side of the table and play it, you find it harmonises. Extraordinary, but it's meant to be played that way for you to there, and I'm playing this with my instrument here, and it makes music, but real music, and, and harmony too. So I think that's an absolute classic of, um, uh, of a genre that Scott Kim has popularised, and Cool is almost like himself. Many people now are making versions of it, but I think his still is the most outstanding of all, and that's um, a wonderful book for it. Um, yes, so there we are, Scott Kim in versions when you turn it upside down. What a man, tremendous, tremendous character, and uh, definitely goes into my collection of fun books, which I shall never get rid of. They're part of my collection. <laughs>